So we're talking about malaria today um, and fever in the returning traveler. Okay. Um, and um, this is highly relevant, as probably all of you know, because we've actually had a few cases of malaria in our um, system. Um, um, one just, what, when did we have a case in the soldier two months ago, a month and a half ago? Two weeks ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and then we had another one that died. He died, right? The, that one that died, and um, so we see this. Um, and um, so, all right. So fever in the traveler has to be be um, um, evaluated immediately because sometimes people can die depending on what they have. So it needs a heads up clinician to sort of connect all the dots, make sure terrible things don't happen. And the most common terrible thing, not that it's extremely common, is cerebral malaria, or occasionally you have spread of a very scary contagious disease like MERS or something like that. So, um, and obviously after the last three years of COVID, we actually know what to do with something like MERS. But about five years ago, I was on the consult service with one of our fellows, and we had a, a rule out MERS, and everyone collectively had a nervous breakdown, and literally no one wanted to go into the room. So it was me and um, Mindy Sampson, who was a fantastic fellow, who had to literally do, you know, group therapy on everybody who refused to go into the room to figure out how to get this person evaluated. And of course, he didn't have mirrors, but still, um, this is where we need to be prepared, figure out what we're doing and understand what's going on. Key question, obviously, you know, um, the point of the talk is where have you been and what did you do during travel? OK, and the other thing is just because someone comes back with a fever after traveling doesn't mean they have something weird and esoteric you have to go through the long differential diagnosis of what what they have what they might have okay all right a very useful website is geosentinel it's a society that was um established in 1995 by the international society of travel medicine and the cdc and it's sort of a network of 63 travel clinics on six continents and they keep track of all the ongoing trends about what's traveling and what's going on. And obviously these days, everything in the world is interconnected. So there are very useful resources as to what's going on, um, what people are seeing and things like that. They periodically publish case reports, um, reviews and things like that about what are the recommendations for travel. And, you know, as if the diagnosis and stuff like that was, um, wasn't difficult enough, what you will find is for some of these infections is what is available for treatment and prophylaxis or conventional practice or even resistance patterns is completely different depending on where you are. So, you know, what, for example, what you we can get for treatment of malaria here in the U.S. is actually pretty different from what you can get in Europe or Africa or India and frequently in um, Africa and lots of Southeast Asia, you can sort of say, I have malaria, give me something, and they will give you something. Um, some of which actually efficacious agents, some of which is counterfeit stuff, some of which is partially effective, and so it can create some real problems. All right. All right. Here. See. All right. So this is actually a review that was in the New England Journal um, by Guy Whites, who is um, based, I think, in Southeast Asia. It's a really busy diagram, okay? And the main point of this is there's a lot of things that it could be, and you really need to be thorough and OCD about going through the decision tree about all the things that it could be, otherwise you are missed up. Right. So this is all the, you know, ID people are known for being thorough in OCD. So this is where you really got to do it um, because the list of things that something could be is pretty long and there's lots of weird, obscure things on the list. All right. 
So this is a completely incomplete list of life-threatening tropical infections characterized by fever. So viral, it's like a bajillion things, right? Influenza, MERS, Ebola, Marburg, uh, all these other hemorrhagic fevers, dengue, Hanta, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, Rift Valley fever, rabies, okay? Uh, dengue is actually the one particularly here in Florida that we see pretty regularly and also is the one that we need to be worried about because that's also one like the other one in red um, on the list, um, plasmodium, that in theory could also be transmitted locally, right? So not only do you need to worry about the travelers coming from places, but you also at times need to be heads up and think about it. Uh, if someone presents in a weird way and think of, oh, well, did some mosquitoes mix with some of the wrong people and and start a lo little local outbreak of something. All right. Bacteria, anthrax, enteric. So the red things, dengue, enteric fever, plasma, falciparum, malaria are the ones that are pretty serious that actually you may see here. OK, all the other ones are things that we always talk about. Um, but probably you won't see, but, you know, obviously this is Tampa General Hospital. You know, we have one of the best VAs in the country. We have a big cancer referral center. And so we see, see all sorts of strange stuff that other health systems wouldn't see. So if anyone's going to see it in the U.S., we'll see it. So you got to be heads up. All right. So, um, so bacteria. You know, anthrax, enteric fever, typhus, leptospirosis, smilidosis, meningococcal infections, oroya fever, plague. Okay. And then among protozoa, malaria, falciparum malaria, dole's eye malaria, um, and actually vivax malaria, you know, is something that you can see, though it's usually not life threatening. That's why it's not on this, and trypanosomiasis. And the other thing about this list, is this is the list of things that will be on the boards. They'll give you some weird epidemiologic clue, some strange clinical symptom, and it will be one of these things on this list, okay? So, you know, I can guarantee um, that for board studying, it, it, some of this will be on the list. Okay, all right. So, since the differential diagnosis seems to be almost infinitely long, and you have to really evaluate the patient really, really thoroughly. The things that you need to think about when you're um, thinking about a returning traveler with fever. So the itinerary, including layovers. There have been cases of someone who laid over in the um, Nairobi airport and got malaria, right? And so, so like detailed, you know, detailed history because, you know, those mosquitoes flying around in the airport, um, you know, uh, can also do stuff that, you know, can happen in the bush. Um, vaccinations and prophylaxis, right? So not everyone goes to a travel doctor and gets all the vaccinations and people get prescribed prophylaxis, but they don't always take it. And even if they take it, they don't always take it like they're supposed to, right? So it's good if they take it, but don't, don't assume anything if they, even if they say they took it. And then, as I said, depending on where you go, you can get all sorts of stuff over the counter or on the street. So that can mask symptoms, delay presentations, all sorts of things. So you need to take a pretty careful history about what someone real took or what they thought they were taking. Other medical problems are also going to make, you know, people, um, you know, um, predisposed to certain kinds of things, right? Um, so if someone is immunologically vulnerable, they're more likely to come up with symptomatic disease in a lot of cases. Obviously, exposure, so unfiltered water, unpasteurized milk, raw food, unwashed produce, you know, whether they drank fresh water, bottled water, um, walking in soil or barefoot on the beach, sexual contacts, um, people don't want to talk about that, but sometimes they go to places explicitly for sexual tourism, right? Um, so people will come back with HIV as a souvenir of their travel. Seriously, seriously. So you got to ask, right? You don't know, right? Um, exposures to ill friends or family, insect bites, right? 
animal bites, animal contacts, bird contacts. So it's a pretty extensive and thorough list because the differential diagnosis is pretty long. All right. So, and then you also need to look at the timing of the fever relative to the travel, all right? So most of these things have general incubation, you know, periods. So that it's, you know, most of these things will happen within a couple of weeks of landing, but you need to find out like how long they were, wherever they were, whether the Simpsons began where they were or whether they began here. A lot of times after people have been traveling, they tend to ignore their symptoms. And so, um, and then, like I said, detailed history, certain things like malaria and stuff like that can present like a year later, right? Um, how they got to wherever they went, what their accommodations were, um, and then the geographic areas can give some clues, whether they went to Africa or Asia, whether they're a rural and urban setting, um, and like I said, food and uh, potential vectors. All right, so the most common diagnoses where we actually make a diagnosis are malaria, and obviously that's exposure to mosquitoes, though, you know, being in Florida, that means nothing being exposed to mosquitoes, right? Dengue, same thing, mosquitoes. Mononucleosis syndromes, that can be EBV, CMV, or HIV. Rickettsial infection, particularly with ticks. Respiratory illness, all right, so influenza obviously um, can be anywhere. And the seasonality of influenza is not the same as it is in other localities. It may be different than here. So just because we don't have influenza here or in the Northeast, doesn't mean that you don't have influenza someplace, right? Enteric fever, and then actually a lot of people, you just have no diagnosis. All right. This is, again, the long list of things. The other thing that you have to worry about is, is not only diagnosing the patient, but are they at, you know, bringing in something that makes everyone else, including you, at risk, okay? So this is where the travel history is really, really important. So if you have somebody who could have Ebola or MERS, right? Hopefully someone in the ED or something noticed and asked, but you know, we had like, I mean, you guys are younger than me, but you know, there was a guy who had Ebola in a Dallas hospital and um, got sent out and it was not good because it didn't occur to them, right? Um, and so, um, you know, so Ebola, all these hemorrhagic fevers, um, you know, influenza, obviously, if it's a really bad one, I mean, regular influenza, not so bad, but mirrors could be bad, uh, plague, no. I don't think we've had a case of pneumonic plague, you know, in the U.S., but still, it's extremely infectious and transmissible. Measles is one that we could see, right? You know, um, chickenpox is also very infectious, right? And, um, you know, chickenpox is something that, you know, we're close to the Caribbean. There doesn't have to seem to be as a lot of endemic chickenpox in the Caribbean um, islands, so people who might be... Um, from the Caribbean might be exposed, that they could come in, they could have traveled, all sorts of things like that. And then pulmonary TB as well, right? So think infection prevention too while you're evaluating the patient. Okay, so if appropriate, I think we've all discussed this, malaria thin and thick smear. Anyone know the difference between a thin and thick smear? I'm told. One tells you if there is malaria, if there are malaria, then the other one sort of gives you a percentage you can sort of quantify it. Yes. All right. So, so I mean, these are if you're not used to doing these things, it's not so easy. So, so basically, a thin smear is like peripheral blood smear, right? So, so classically, you use Gimsa because it's easier to see the parasites, but you know, a regular right stain is is good enough if you know what you're doing. Um, but you know, you know. The attendings in the room are old enough that we looked at peripheral blood smears are, well, excepting um, Dr. Moore and, and Dr. Katzman, but, you know, <laughs> Dr. Montero and, and, and um, Ehler and I, 
among the things that we had to do when we were babies like you is we had to go look at the peripheral smear. And if we had a particularly mean resident, they wanted to know whether you looked at it yourself and you actually knew if it had whatever, right? You know, and we actually had to do the gram stains ourselves and stuff like that. So most of us like, well, at least I have, since I always work in pretty busy urban places, I personally diagnosed malaria using blood smears that I did myself. But most of you haven't, and you probably can't even get a blood smear half the time around here, okay? So then, and then good luck getting a reading from a tech <laughs> in the middle of the night. Here, you, you might be able to, but other hospitals, you know, it, it's, you know, it's like an act of God. All right, but... <laughs> But all right, so the thick smears are actually pretty hard to read, um, you know, and so it's basically concentrated blood. You lice the red blood cells and then you look for white cells and parasite forms. And that's the most sensitive way of looking for parasites. OK, uh, the thin smear is just looking for parasites. And if you're good at what you're doing, you can actually speciate based on on the thin smear. All right. And that, believe it or not, you know in this modern era is the gold standard for diagnosis here in the US and in the world, okay? So this is why it actually becomes relevant. Now, there's also a rapid diagnostic test for malaria if it's available. Um, they're testing it out here, but we don't have it available. And like all RTTs, it's not as sensitive, right? Um, probably for the thing that's the medical emergency, falciparum, it's sensitive enough, but um, it's not sensitive for all cases of malaria. And then, you know, the usual thing, CBC, electrolytes, LFTs, including Billy's, um, blood cultures, UA, stool for OMP, or or these days, you know, molecular test GI panels, um, chest X-ray, HIV, you know, monospite, spot, you know, hepatitis serology, coagulation profiles. But this will all depend on, you know, the travel history and what you've decided is high high priority in the differential diagnosis, right? So you don't have to necessarily get all of these things, but this is where talking to the patient and, you know, and getting your differential diagnosis of what's possible is really, really important. Okay. So the thing about malaria, and um, you guys are probably aware of this because of the, both the recent cases and all the publicity, is um, if you travel, to an endemic area and have a history of fever, uh, even if the fever is no longer present, you believe the patient and you work up malaria, okay? So malaria fevers tend to be periodic and no one entirely knows why, but people like most fevers that tend to happen in the afternoon, but malaria fevers tend, if they're periodic, they tend to happen at night. So they're at two in the morning. So if someone comes in and says, I feel miserable, and I've been having fevers and they don't have a fever and it's in the morning or in the afternoon, believe them and work up malaria, okay? The malaria smear, because it's periodic and because it correlates to when the parasites lice out of the infected red cell, the malaria smears can be negative if the parasitemia is relatively low. And also falciparum tends to, the mature forms tend to sequester in um, the, the peripheral organs so you won't see it in the blood, okay? So because of that, if they have a suggestive enough history, you have to work them up and you usually need to get more than one smear, all right? If, if the index of suspicion is high. The physical exam could be completely normal or if abnormal, it may be abnormal in a way that's completely nonspecific, all right? They come in with a febrile illness and, you know, um, the incubation period is usually less than a month, usually within a couple of weeks. And prophylaxis doesn't mean malaria is ruled out. Ruled out. And often, like people who live in malaria endemic areas, if they're stationed there, frequently don't take malaria. Often, if once it's like true confessions time, you know, were you given malaria prophylaxis? Did it take it? Most people say yes. But then when you talk to them a, a little bit later and they're talking about it, they said, well, you know, I might have skipped a few doses. <laughs> so it's not that you don't believe them, right? But that does not at all affect whether you try to um, work them up from Larry. But the problem is that they took prophylaxis, it might be a little bit harder to diagnose because, you know, um, it may take a while to take off. All right. 
So severe malaria, falciparum malaria, occasionally nose eye malaria, um, is a life-threatening medical emergency. Nonspecific compress, compress, progress really, really quickly. And you can have somebody sort of talking to you and fine, and then literally at death's door in less than 24 hours. Completely normal person too, okay? And they can lose consciousness, they can have pulmonary edema, they can get acidotic, they can have renal failure, they can have shock. That's usually plasmonium falciparum. And the case that we had, you know, was a young soldier who was in his 20s. And Dr. Kandapi, who took care of him, said she really thought he was going to die. You know, um, and Noel's eye, which is a zoonosis and pretty much in Southeast Asia and stuff like that, can also present the same way. So that usually clearly, uh, I mean, that's pretty rare here. You, you see more on the West Coast just because, you know, it's in, you know, a, a, you know, a constrained geographic area. But obviously we get travelers from all over the place, so it doesn't mean we can't get it. All right, people with plasmodium vivax. Um, in the malaria world, it's it's like people with um, faster from can die. Um, people with vivax feel like they're going to die. All right, so they feel terrible, right? You know, but the parasitemia tends to be low. They feel god awful, but they actually usually don't die. So this is not mean that you shouldn't pick it up and be the good doctor and and but. Vivax is not that same level of medical emergency as falciparum. All right. So malaria. Forty percent of the world's population lives in malaria endemic areas, um, and the human malaria effect. I mean, I don't even know where they get these statistics because you know how can you count malaria malaria cases in the middle of the forest? Supposedly it's 250 million people and 600,000 uh, deaths per year. And if you, any of you have been to um, Africa, you know that it's like a little piece of paper done at the county, you know, thing that's transmitted to the National Health Office on yet another piece of paper. So these statistics, you have to take them with a grain of salt, but you can't follow trend lines, right? So, um, and, you know, during the COVID era, we didn't have any malaria because no one was reporting any malaria, but no one believed that, right? Um, so. It's associated with huge world poverty, huge economic cost, and the CDC, Tulane, um, you know, College of Public Health, Hopkins College of Public Health were all started for malaria control because we had malaria in the U.S. Okay, um, until the 50s, and officially we were certified as having no malaria in 1970. All right, so obviously, you know what's going on here in Florida and Sarasota. And with global warming and world travel and Florida being Florida and mosquitoes being everywhere, if, if malaria is going to come back and be endemic again, it will happen here, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So malaria has a long and illustrious history, all right? It's been known for, you know, millennia. Um, in Italian, the name came from mal aria, so bad air. So people did know somehow it was in the air. Turned out it was in the air because it was mosquitoes, but there have been a lot of Nobel Prizes associated with malaria. All right, Labyrinth discovered the blood stages. Ronald Ross um, proved that mosquitoes transmitted it. The first sort of medication, which became quinine, was from the donut tree. So one of the big fights was, um, you know, like controlling areas and islands that had these trees because as part of, you know, the wars for global domination, countries would literally fight for the islands that had these trees but because they the, the generals knew that infectious diseases were killing their soldiers, okay? Um, all sorts of weird stuff happened. Malaria was actually used to treat syphilis. So you did fever induction, Treated, and then treated the malaria with quinine. And there's another guy who got a Nobel Prize for treating syphilis with malaria. Um, and then obviously, um, Dr. Tu discovered artemisinin and drugs that, um, from, and, and that she won uh, in 2015. So malaria is a big deal. All right. So plasmodium um, is the causative agent of malaria. There's hundreds of named species. Most of them are exquisitely adapted to their hosts, so reptiles, birds, rodents, monkeys, animals, you know, of all sorts. And there's all these different peculiarities about the different species and stuff like that. It's thought 
that the human malaria has jumped from primates at some point or another. Um, and there are five species, Falciparum, Vivax, Malaria, Ovalia, Nolzai. Nolzai is a zoonosis. So it's primarily one of primates, but because of the close relationship between humans and primates, it's jumped over. Um, so it's primarily zoonosis, but it's also one that potentially could become more regularly seen in people. Um, the mosquito that transmitted is the female Anopheles mosquito, and we have Anopheles mosquitoes here in Florida. Uh, its range is fairly short, so only a, a mile or two. So this is where you can do localized vector um, control policies to get rid of mosquitoes if you're trying to control malaria. And that's a mainstay of malaria control. All right. So Vivax is the malaria species that's been in temperate zones. So that's the, the species that we had here in the U.S. Uh, before we eliminated malaria. Um, and that's what was also in Italy and Europe. Ociprum is mostly tropics and subtropics. Malaria is same range as falciparum, but less common. And Knowles, I, like I said, but less common, looks like plasmodium malaria as far as its morphology, but it's way more deadly. And Ovali is um, West Africa. And, and what's now with better molecular tools, it used to be thought since it, everything was diagnosed by um, um, smears, it was thought that you only usually had one um, infection, but now that we've got better molecular tools and stuff like that, it it's turn, turns out that probably co-infection is more common than originally thought. And the, the significance of that is not really, really clear. But in the old days, we were, we were taught, well, even though you might be susceptible to two kinds of um, infection, you were generally didn't get it. But now with the molecular epidemiology, that seems not to be true. So and it's unclear whether that's change in factor, or change in drugs, change in malaria control, or just that we have better tests. All right. So in endemic areas, clinical malaria is the disease of the young. OK, so this is um, from uh, a Nick White paper in The Lancet. So red, the red line, so, so um, the population of people is on the y-axis. The x-axis is eight, goes up to 50. And the red line is severe malaria. So those are the deaths. And that's pretty much kids under the age of five. And they die of cerebral malaria and anemia. Um, and then as they grow up, they acquire partial immunity, OK, so that they can get sick occasionally. Um, but you know, in areas that where malaria is endemic, you do a profile of school-aged children, and 30 to 40% will have parasites in the blood just there. And then they'll get something called partial premonition and premonition. In other words, adults walking around, you just check their blood and they'll have parasites and they seem to be completely fine, okay? So there is no sterile immunity, all right? And the other thing about uh, malaria that's significant is that you leave a malaria endemic area, whatever was magic about you being exposed all the time goes away. And so after a year or two, you're vulnerable again. All right, so you lived all your life in some place where they have tons of malaria. You had a few cases when you were a kid. You don't take prophylaxis. You're fine. You grow up. You come here. You go to Europe. You live for a few years. You go back, and you're all of a sudden susceptible. Yeah. All right. So, so this is what happens to us. So we have about two thousand cases of malaria a year. Um, in two thousand eighteen. There were 1,800 reported uh, confirmed malaria, 98% were, were imported, and one case was transmitted by a BMT. And that was actually one of our cases at Moffitt. So um, it was mostly falciparum and Vivex. Most are imported from Africa. Most didn't take prophylaxis. And this is where it's significant. Most were visiting friends and relatives. And the deaths almost always happen because someone didn't think of it or there was a delay in diagnosis or inappropriate treatment. So that case over at Moffitt was because a hematology tech was very on the ball. Notice the malaria on the blood smear, all right? The person who got the BMT did not, had not been in a malaria endemic area. Turned out her sister had been, and maybe she sort of got treated, but 
she never really got treated and she certainly never thought she had malaria, right? Um, and a lab tech picked it up, called the very on the ball ID fellow, right? Um, yeah, were they your year or they, they were, uh, yeah, okay. So anyhow, so, so basically, so Nate goes, you know, and, and runs around trying to figure out what to do, tries to get, she doesn't look so hot, you know, um, and tries to get artesanate from the CDC. And at the time, um, and, and they gave her oral, oral meds and her paracetamol was going down, um, but her, she was getting more confused. And he tried to get artesanate from the CDC and their instructions were, do not give her artesanate. We only have one batch and we have limited number of vials. So they basically, getting artesanate from the CDC was like literally an act of God. David Friedman, who's a world famous travel medicine person said, if you want it, you just have to lie and say, you know, that, that no, seriously, this is what he used to tell me is just lie and figure out what it takes to tell them and and, and they'll send it to otherwise they will log out. So, so anyhow, so Nate calls me up and said, I hear you're a malaria expert. This doesn't sound right. And I said, no, you're absolutely right. Um, try calling them back and stuff like that. He goes, yes, their parasite is going, but she's getting more confused. She looks really awful. I'm really worried. <laughs> so I said, all right call around somebody might still have some IV quinidine and um, give her everything that you can that's oral you know find some quinine you know find some doxycycline see if you can get her to take it and call around and see if someone has IV quinidine and the VA fortunately did have some so she got some IV quinidine and then I think a day later they finally did get artesanate but literally this was um, Nate and Mindy who was actually the regular um, Moffat ID fellow going the extra, you know, 15 miles to make sure that the right thing happened, right? And and so, you know, so this is where um, that made a difference. And and similarly, the case that we had was was Anna Sakura and Guy Handley coming in to make sure that this kid had malaria. Unfortunately, he died because we didn't have our IV artesanate, and he, it was everywhere. But still. You know, it was them going and then working hard with Dr. Montero's stewardship team. So we had artesanate. So then when we had the soldier from the Congo that Dr. Kandapi thought was going to die, we at least had our IV artesanate. So this is where, you know, you look at all the case reports of people who die in the U.S. It's because someone didn't think about it. And Mindy actually told me of a case that she had. It was the beginning of COVID and some woman had been in Liberia. And they were so sure she had COVID that it never dawned on them to figure out whether she had malaria. So she came in and, and, and nearly died, went into renal failure and got cerebral malaria because no one checked a malaria smear until she'd been like in like three times. OK, so this is a, a medical emergency. And if you don't think of it, you won't. And, and getting treatment is real pain in the neck now. I put these slide in because this is also important since we're in Florida. We do occasionally get episodes of locally acquired mosquito-borne malaria. All right, so this is 57 to 2003, and you can see one or two sporadically, you know, in the U.S., right? Not very often, usually in California, Texas, or Florida, all right? And until this past year, the most recent one was 2003. And... The most recent outbreak was actually in Palm Beach. Um, eight cases of IVAX. Most had never traveled to a malaria endemic area. They were confirmed by smear and PCR treated with quinine, doxy, and primaquine. And molecular typing showed that they were all the similar isolate. No mosquitoes were positive. And there were sp sporadic reports in Florida, Texas, California. And there are Anopheles uh, mosquitoes still in the US. Every once in a while, it has been falciparum because there's no reason why it can't be falciparum, but falciparum isn't as adapted to our climate. So, and I mean, honestly, no one knows why, but 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 the locally acquired um, outbreaks have pretty much all been um, um, Vivax, though there have been an occasional one that have been falciparum. And, you know, obviously, if you get enough here, there's no reason why falciparum couldn't adapt to here. But Vivax is probably less of a jump for it, given our climate, than it is for um, falciparum. All right, so 
don't think it can't be falciparum, but in in fact, it it it, it has pretty much been um, um, vivax most of the times it's happened. All right, so we are famous for all the wrong reasons for malaria here. All right, um, so the first local case. Um, happened in so so we have also have travelers plasmodium vivax so sarasota um, um memorial so the first local transmitted case which apparently was on a homeless person um was in may 2023 there have been seven cases today the last one was about two weeks ago all are p vivax um so this is the map that's sarasota county that's manatee it's no, northern Sarasota County, right on the border between Manatee and Sarasota. And what's a little scary is three mosquitoes during their arbovirus surveillance were actually po positive. So that's like finding a needle in the haystack. So it's a little worrisome that we found three mosquitoes that were positive. So they've been spraying like crazy in Sarasota <laughs> County, as you might imagine. Huh? They found seven. There's more than seven. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. 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 This is the point. <laughs> this is this is the point. You should have found zero. Those mosquitoes should be hard to find, and yeah. and someone found them just incidentally. An arbovirus. <laughs> so this is all the you know the different things that they look for, and they scratch the mosquito. I mean, and even if it's scare, you know, I mean, it's I mean the chances of that being positive are like pretty low. All right. So anyhow, the Florida DOH people are appropriately concerned. And they could string like crazy. Yes. How do they find these mosquitoes? Okay. They just randomly trap them and they test them. So, 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 so this is why this is why it is incredibly yeah. remarkable and a little scary that they found this, right? Because this is like literally, literally. Still trapped. <laughs> I, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, so they have little. So, so, so literally, if I'm looking for, you know anything and i just randomly pick people and just do random testing without any idea what's going on what are the odds of me finding it like it has to be really prevalent for me to find it right so anyhow that's a little scary to me right and once again this is a situation where we had a really 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 heads up hematology tech at sarasota memorial i don't know why they got the peripheral blood smear because obviously it's not routine here but Anyhow, a really on the ball hematology tech said, you know, all right, homeless person who comes in with fever. It could be anything, right? And I mean, maybe it's because I think they all had thrombocytopenia. So maybe that's why they 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 were worried about TTP or something else. So maybe that's why they did the peripheral blood smear. Anyhow, they did the peripheral blood smear and a very heads up hematology tech said, huh, there's malaria here and called up the ID doctors and then they changed their protocol so that they actually in service the RDTs and stuff like that. So Sarasota Memorial, Sarasota Memorial actually has the RDT and they changed their protocol so that they can actually diagnose malaria pretty well. And so that they've actually diagnosed, I think of the seven cases, they've had like five there. So um, and actually, um, we're, you know, in a collaboration with CDC and DOH up at NID, our VR malaria group um, is actually trying to see if we can type them to see if they're the same isolate or not. So we don't know what. So, so we have four of the samples that we're trying to type up there. So, uh, and so we'll have to see if we have any more. I know they've been spraying like crazy, but this is, but this is another thing, right? That, that, you know, if that, that lab tech hadn't been pretty experienced and on the ball, right? Okay, so be, be coming to, to the lab techs too. All right, so plasmodium. All right, so the life cycle is one where the female Anopheles um, mosquito um, injects sporozoids into the blood. Those sporozoids are like homing missiles. You only need like two or three probably to go straight for the liver and set up malaria infection. So they're really efficient at what they do, all right? And then they bring, um, grow up thousands of merozoites that invade the red cells, all right? So this is completely clinically silent, but the liver stage is very, very important because it's required for transmission and acquisition of malaria. 
it's the site for a lot of the prophylactic treatments for malaria, right? And um, the CSP vaccine targets in the liver stages. Okay, so so it's very very important. Clinical malaria is all the repeated red cell stages. Okay, so that's where you get the fevers and the lysing out, and then you get the gametocytes. You know, there's some signaling, and then that's what's picked up by the female mosquito again and, and reinitiates the cycle. And every phase of that cycle is essential for transmission of malaria. Okay, so. So that's why spraying for mosquitoes will stop transmission of malaria. And that's why also vaccines and um, drugs targeting the liver stage, if it works, will also stop transmission of malaria. Are people with like cirrhosis or liver disease more or less at risk? Like, is it a, a worse environment? For the I don't know. Sensor? I mean, because, you know, the problem is where malaria is, you know, Probably people with cirrhosis and stuff like that do so badly from all the other things that they would get that they like, like it's, it's, it's sort of would be hard to know. I mean, like where there's a lot of malaria, I think it's sort of hard to live a long time with cirrhosis, right? Because it's like in the middle of Africa, right? So I don't know. And then, you know, doing a cohort study, how would you know, right? So, so I think it would be hard to tell. I don't know. All right, so that's a female Anopheles mosquito. That's sporozoites, um, and and like I said, those are homing missiles that are, like have an incredible. They're very efficient, right? They have to go into the skin, make it out of the skin, into your blood system, and make it to the liver. And they're very good at doing what they do, right? And then they um, have a replication phase in the liver. Um, and, you know, one or two can make thousands, right? And this is completely clinical silent. There's no way you would know if this had happened to you. All right, so two of the species, Vivax and Ovalley, are special in that they have some sort of mechanism that no one understands where some of the parasites go on and make merozoites that infect the blood. And some of them just go to sleep. So hypnozoite, hypno means sleeping. And there's some of them that just sort of sit there sleeping for unclear reasons. And what's actually sort of interesting about it is um, how frequently what they wake up seems to correlate with, you know, how possible it is to transmit and seasonal, like when mosquitoes are around. So they... Um, so the relapse rate in tropical areas where there's mosquitoes around all the time seems to be higher than in temperate areas where there's more seasonality with mosquitoes and things like that, which is very strange and very interesting. But All right. So if you're talking about the erythrocytic schizogeny, in other words, the replication in the red cells, um, Noel's eye, and this is why Noel's eye is so dangerous, is it can go through the whole cycle in 24 hours. So we can go from some to a lot really quickly. Falciparum, ovalley, um, Vivax, so 48 hour cycle, 72 hours for malaria. You know, this is also something that who knows, it could be on the boards. Is this functionally important? Probably not, but, um, but um, and, and classically, though this also is not incredibly helpful. Um, you know, you have periodic fevers, right? So classically you have fevers every two days with Vivax and Ovalley and Falcipro. Is that really, really helpful for making a diagnosis? Not really, but this could be on the words, right? For Falcipro, really, if there's a periodic fever, you know, they, they tend to have it at night, but they frequently just have fevers, you know, in, in less synchronous pattern, okay? Um, and that probably is because they can infect any red cells. So there, there are some on today's cycle and some on, you know, yesterday's cycle. And, and, and that's the story. Okay. But there are differences in the fever curves. And this is sort of one of the classic, you know, old time parasitology, you know, things that people, very smart clinicians noticed a long time ago. So do the fevers correlate with like when the lysine? Yes. Cells? Yes. So that's why the fevers tend to be at night for reasons that are, I don't understand why malaria parasites know it's nighttime, but they know. And even the lab, 
they know. Like I used to work on malaria a long time and I tried to get them to lice out during the day. And after like literally six months of trying to get them to be obedient, I realized it was easier for me to drive into the lab at midnight because because they just lice out at night. I don't know why. But they but so so there is something about something or other that they're programmed to lice out at night. Now it makes sense, you know, thinking biologically, right? You know, in that lysing out in the evening and things like that, you know, that's when people are lying down. That's why I you know, when mosquitoes might be around and stuff like that. Um, but why? Completely beyond me, but but they definitely tend to lice at night and those fevers tend to be all that toxic stuff, sort of, you know, basically all these red cells explode, release all this stuff that makes your immune system very angry. And that's why you get the fever. So 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 this is why, you know, getting those blood smears in the middle of the night are frequently the highest yield if the parasitemia is low. I mean, with the falciparum, you usually, you know, you can see low levels because it's not as synchronous and things like that. But that's why you can have the right history, but you might not pick it up. Okay, so diagnosis, right? Think of the diagnosis because it's not so easy to make the diagnosis, all right? Um, so this is a picture of the thick smear and the thin smear. The thick smear um, is the one that you, you know, do a drop of blood, let the red cells lice, then you stain it. And honestly, I, you know, I can't really read a, a thick smear. I've looked at a whole bunch of them, and I, I would never say that I could actually, you know, thin smears, um, you know, are important for morphology and also quantitating the parasitemia. Um, now we treat everybody the same way, but in the old days you know, where, you know, quinine was hard to find, but there was still chloroquine sensitivity and stuff like that. And there was patchy drug resistance. You know, what we were told, and this is also easier to just go sick the medical student to go do the blood smear themselves. Um, you know, seriously, you know, this is, this is, you know, like when you were a med student in medic, oh, go do a blood smear on that patient in, you know, blah, 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 and, to, and then bring it to me and we'll go look at it. Uh, but in any case, what the recommendation was, though I don't think we can do it this age, is literally to get blood smears every eight hours for two to three days to see, number one, if they're getting better, right? And if they don't get better, you worry that they have resistant organisms or something bad is happening, right? And so that's still the recommendation that you get serial blood smears. But given the fact that you frequently can't get them and get them red, it's a little bit less useful. Yes? Seems thick and thin are just visually how they look or is there some other no no it, it literally is like a blood smear is is, is the the thin is, is is exactly like a peripheral blood smear so so you you take a little drop and then you slide it across and you make it like a feathered thin suspension i mean you've probably looked at blood smears at, at some point and a thick smear is literally you put a drop on there let it dry then you like you know pop all the red cells you know let them all pop wash it all away and then stain with usually it's Ginza, which will stain the white cells and the parasites and then you normalize the parasite count to the number of white cells and that gives you a rough sense of how many parasites there are so then then if you have low levels of parasitemia you can sort of normalize and have some idea of how many parasites there are like the lab Text here, if you ask them to prepare like a thick smear, it's middle of the night. I mean, I could look at a thin smear in the lab and right. maybe know what I'm right. looking at, but how, who would we get to like help us? Uh, honestly, honestly, listen, if, if you're thinking about medical emergency, right? If the parasitemia is so low that you can't see it on a thin smear, if you know what you're doing, probably it's not the medical emergency, right? You know, it's only if the parasitemia is high and they have falciparum that you should be freaking out, right? The thick smear is for medical thoroughness and making sure you're treating somebody. But if you don't see it on a peripheral smear, but by definition, if you know what you're doing, right? They don't have a very high paracetamia, right? So, so, so yes, you should, to be thorough, you should get the thick smear, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, you know, especially if you're just trying to figure out how, 
whether we have any co-R, Tim, or what we're going to do, and everyone's having a nervous breakdown because they have no idea what to do about malaria, this should not be our priority, right? It's getting the diagnosis, figuring out whether the paracetamol is getting, you know, calming the nerves so everybody gets the patient treated appropriately. But if in the thin smear, you can't see it, and, and, and there are people who know what they're doing and are looking for parasites, and you can't find it by definition, right? There, there can't be that many parasites, even if you have the right diagnosis, right? So not to worry, let the lab deal with thick smear and stuff like that, right? So um, Sorry, I probably already said this, but is it better to get a smear when they're fevering? Yes. That's the best time. Yes. Okay. So if that for some reason occurred like during the day. Yeah. But 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 the, so this is why though you know this is this is one of the problems with modern medicine and stuff like that is like you know we used to be extremely low tech so you could like and, and since you know I'm in the era where if you wanted a lab done went and grow it yourself because they, it was like hopeless to get the blood draw team or somebody to do it right so you literally you you like he was on the sign out seat, you know, said somebody to go check the malaria smear at two in the morning, right? Um, and then obviously if someone spiked in the middle of the night, you got called, right? Um, so then you could go, you know, get it done. So getting a Q8 or Q12 blood smear actually was more feasible than it is now, you know? Um, and then, you know, in the old days, you know, you could go down to the lab, you know, most places had a little lab in the ER or something like that. So you could do basic staining or if you had a big lab like HAT, you could go like you knew that you could be nice to the heme techs in the middle of the night and they would stick it in their thing and stain it for you. And then you'd come back like an hour later and you'd go look at it. So, all right. So now we're talking about other ways of diagnosing malaria. So um, so you can do immunologic detection of plasma and falcid from antigens, HRP2, and that's the the rapid diagnostic test that's done um, um, in, um, you know, in Africa. So it's a single test. You can have immunologic detection of another sort of pan malaria antigen, aldolase or LDH. Um, you can do fluorescence by process. So this is fluorescence of, um, you know, of plasma. Of course, you know, I mean, we're not going to be able to get that. I mean, that's cool. And then state labs for confirmation and things like that, they confirm by PCR or DNA probes, but that's also something that you're going to get in a specialty lab. All right. So realistically speaking, we're going to have RDTs here um, and we're going to have peripheral blood smears here. Is it way over? Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, all right. Well, like, let's see. All right. So, so this is what uh, RDT looks like, right? This looks like the COVID test. It's, it's the principle is the same, right? Um, and um, um, and and it, it's exactly the same, right? And so, like all RDTs, it's easy to use, but it's not as sensitive, okay? Um, and then so I'm just going to show you pictures of falciparum, all right? So these are the stages of falciparum right there. That's a thick smear. I mean, can you? I mean, like that's impossible to figure out what all of that is unless you're used to, right? In the in the corner. The gametocytes, classically those banana-shaped gametocytes, so that's also something that could be on the board. So I'll show you a blood smear and say, what does this person have? You see the banana shape, that's falciparum, right? Propozoas and shizons, person is really sick if you see that in the person. You will not see that. If you do, worry, because that's really bad. Uh, but you will see those ring forms. Vivax. See, um, Vivax is easier to pick up. Lower parasitemia, but you know, you'll see the Schuffner stocks. The red cells will look, you know, obviously like weird and abnormal, right? Like, you no, know, like this, like, like you will know that doesn't look right, right? <laughs> so you just have to find it. No, I'm serious. I'm serious, right? This is pattern recognition. Like, you know, it doesn't take a lot of genius to figure out that that there's something wrong with that red cell, right? Yeah. Malaria, similar type thing, right? And the problem is malaria and nosei look almost identical. It's just that the clinical course is different. And ovale also, right? The, 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 the red cells look really weird, right? And the red cells look oval, right? So if you find something like that, then it's not hard to figure. It doesn't really matter what species it is. You know that that's, that's not normal, right? But obviously, 
you know, the experts can tell, but if there's clinical overlap, you know, that's Noel's eye, falciparum, and malaria. Even if you're an expert, it would be hard to tell the difference between those, right? Um, so that's why even, you know, um, so so it's you make the diagnosis and then you deal try to decide if it's a medical emergency. Basically, it correlates with what the parasite burden is. Falciparum is the worst. Noel's eye actually also can be really, really bad. Malaria, a Vivex can be enough that it makes you feel really, really bad. But because Vivex and Ovali are in reticulocytes, right? Like you never have more than one or 2% reticulocytes, even if your bone marrow is completely going crazy, right? So there's a limit to how, how much of a parasitemia you can have because it can't go into more mature red cells, whereas falciparum can go into more mature red cells, right? So that's why the parasitemia can be very high. And another piece of medical trivia that may be on the boards is malaria goes into old cells. What is it with malaria that in the, um... The kidneys, you said down there, it's a complications, renal. You know, I'm not sure why people get it, but associated with falciparum malaria, um, people do, they get black water fever, that's from quinine, we don't give quinine, but they, 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 they get renal failure. I mean, they basically get multi, adults get multi-system failure and they get renal failure and uh, why they get it, I'm not really sure. I don't think people know. You know, it, it, they, they, they basically get clinical shock. Yeah, ATN probably. Yeah, it's probably ATN, but the exact mechanism, you know, it's, it's you know, we don't have so much here. Um, it tends to be, this whole multi-system failure tends to be adults rather than kids. So in endemic areas where you can study a lot of malaria, you actually don't see adults that get that sick because they're all immune, right? So, so the exact mess is probably ATN, but I'm not really sure. But you know, obviously, they come in with like bad shock, and then um, you know, and then uncomplicated malaria. It's completely nonspecific. The one thing that you see that's a little weird that might tip you off, and that's probably why these people in Sarasota got their peripheral blood smear, is you do get thrombocytopenia with both five X, pretty much all malarias. Right. So that might prompt somebody to go look at a peripheral blood smear. And if it gets worse, then you might see anemia. But anemia, you tend, it probably would not, unless they're really, really sick, it probably would not be so bad that that would trigger a, you know, like, let's find out what's going on search. So severe malaria, uh, multi organ failure, and that's mostly adults. Kids die of cerebral malaria and anemia but you can die of air, yes. And lab criteria for severe malaria, even though if the patient doesn't look bad, is if they've got a hematocrit less than 20, glucose less than 40, parasitemia greater than 5% lactic acidus. I mean, this is like, obviously, they got labs that look terrible. <laughs> I mean, this is not a subtle thing, right? <laughs> um, um, but hopefully you've made the diagnosis before that. I mean, pretty much here in the U.S., if someone has falciparum malaria, you admit them and you observe them and treat them. A lot of places you don't do that, but here, that's what we would do, right? And that's been true since I was a medical student, right? Um, as a falciparum treatment, resistance common, pretty much everyone would treat it with an ACT. Um, some places, depending on where they come from, you can still treat with chloroquine, but... I don't think anyone would do that these days. Um, and if you severe, you would treat with IV artesanate. Um, you can treat with atovoclone, quinine. Um, in theory, you can treat with chloroquine, but I don't think anyone would do that in this day and age. Vivax, according to the WHO guidelines, they don't really care what kind of malaria is treat with an ACT. Of course, the US CDC can't agree with that. And so ACT is not. Uh, um, approved by the FDA for treatment of Vivax. So if you look at the CDC recommendations, ACT is not on them for Vivax, but it does work. So ACT, except for the areas where you've got artemisinin resistance in Southeast Asia, works for any kind of malaria at, as, as of this writing. But, but if you look at the CDC guidelines, you will be confused. Like, how come that's not there? It's because of regulatory things rather than efficacy. And then you do need to treat for the liver stages if you have documented Vivax. If you're in doubt at all, the person looks terrible, you're not sure, treat like or falciparum. 
And you do need to get a G6PD to clear the liver stages and preferably quantitative, because if you're a little bit G6PD deficient, you can give sort of a lower dose of primaquin safely. If they're really deficient, then, then you can't give it. And so you actually need a quantitative G six PD, which I don't even know. I think it's a send out test here. It's a send out. I can't get back. It's just yeah. So so this is this is another logistical problem that we have to deal with. All right. So the take home message, and I'm sorry I went over time. Um, so malaria looks like a lot of other things. So the most important thing is for someone to think about it. History is key, but Obviously, here we are in Florida and in Sarasota, more than half of the people, according, I mean, they haven't released all of this, but like I said, because we've been, our lab is very connected with the people in Sarasota and we've been in discussions, more than half the people who got it in Sarasota are actually housing challenged. Um, so, um, and they are sort of localized in the same geographic area. Um, so, again, a case of, heads up lab people, smart ID people who knew what to do made a difference in these kinds of cases.